Hey everybody, so it's the top of the hour. We're gonna get started. Um, welcome to Logic Models and Libraries. I'm Devin Waugh, the Instruction Librarian at NC Live. And I just wanna give a quick intro. Um, so um, this session will be hosted by Jennifer Arnold, who is the Director of Library Services at Central Piedmont Community College, um, which is a library system that has, you know, six different college campuses and, um, there's a lot of moving parts involved in this um, approach of using logic models sounded like something that was incredibly interesting and inventive um, for working with such a broad, widely distributed campus. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna have Jennifer take it away. Um, you'll probably see me throughout the session just in the chat um, and I'll be the one sending the follow-up email later this afternoon. But thank you all for being here today. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Logic Models and Libraries. I'm glad that you were able to join us today to learn a little more about a simple graphic tool that can help you with a range of library planning, reporting, and assessment needs. Here's a quick look at our agenda for today's webinar. We'll take a look at what a logic model is and does, um, what the common terminology you see in logic models means, ways logic models might be useful to you and your library, and a look at both a public and an academic example of a logic model in action. Um, we're also going to walk through completing a simple logic model in order to give you a little bit of experience in using one in a planning scenario. Before we dive into the agenda, I'll just take a minute to introduce myself and explain how my interest in logic models developed. Um, like Devin said, my name is Jennifer Arnold and I'm the Director of Library Services at Central Piedmont Community College, which is a large multi-campus uh, community college here in Mecklenburg County. We do have seven libraries on six campuses. Um, and as part of my role at Central Piedmont, I handle a lot of project management, management, a lot of reporting, and those kind of responsibilities. So I've always been interested in tools that help me um, to do that kind of work. In 2019, I finished a master's in public administration at UNC Chapel Hill, and that's where I really came to learn a lot about the effectiveness and the uses of logic models, which are pretty um, commonly and widely used across public administration um, and the nonprofit worlds. I'm also the vice chair of the Project Outcome for Academic Libraries editorial board, and Project Outcome has used logic models in a theory of change approach, which we'll talk about a little bit as well, to um, the idea of outcomes measurement in academic and public libraries. Um, we'll have time at the end for questions that you might have, but you can also feel free to put any questions in chat that, to make sure that we get to them as they pop up. And my email is also here if you have any questions that pop up later. So before, um, we're gonna start with a poll question that's designed to just give me a general gauge of what you might already know about logic models. So just take a second and select the answer that sort of best fits for you. So everyone should be able to see that on their screen. All right, so I'm going to end this poll and share out the results with everybody. Great, thank you for answering that question. So we have most people fall into the familiar with them, um, but haven't used one and not familiar with the logic models, which um, is not entirely surprising. I didn't really know much about logic models before um, my MPA program. You don't see them as widely used in libraries, although there are some examples that we'll look at. Um, but I do think they can be really useful tools for a lot of the planning, reporting, assessment, and um, those kinds of activities that we engage in. So good, so this review of terminology and some examples and, and what these terms really mean will hopefully be helpful for you all 
as we go through. So yes, this portion of the presentation, we're going to just sort of define logic models and theories of change. We're going to look at the terminology that's commonly used so that you understand um, what the logic model is asking you to fill out in any particular section. And then as well as some potential uses where you might employ um, a logic model in your day-to-day -day work at the library. So, um, the big concept we're going to start with is this idea of a theory of change. And a theory of change is essentially a comprehensive description and sometimes illustration, it can be graphic, it can be written out, of how and why a desired change is expected to happen in a particular context. So it's focused on mapping out or filling in what has been described as the missing middle between what a program or change initiative does, the activities, and how these lead to the desired goals being achieved. It's explaining why if I engage in these activities, is this change at the end for my patrons or my community going to happen? So in other words, a theory of change explains how the activities undertaken by your library contribute to a chain of results that lead to intended or observed impacts. What impact do you want your program to have? You're explaining how that's going to happen. Um, it does this by first identifying the, identifying the desired long-term goals and then often works backwards from these to identify all the conditions or outcomes that must be in place and how these relate to one another causally for the goals to occur. So essentially, as you can see from the example, it might be a little small for you there. Um, it's a very big picture flow chart that indicates specifically how your library can actually create the change that your programs or services set out to do. Um, you often hear the terms theory of change and logic model used together and sometimes almost interchangeably because they both can be graphic, but the difference between them can be sort of one of scale. So I like to think of theories of change as more strategic and big picture oriented and contains more of the why change will occur as a result of your action. That's kind of that idea of the missing middle. Um, while logic models can be much um, simpler, um, they can focus more directly on a single program or service. And like I said, theories of change can also be written out. They don't necessarily have to take um, graphic form. So let's um, focus now on um, defining a logic model. So I'm going to run through a couple of definitions that you see on your screen and we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, a logic model is a visual diagram that illustrates how your program will work to fill your patrons identified needs. In simpler terms, logic models communicate a library's project or program or service, operations, activities, and goals. There are a couple of other defining characteristics of logic models. They are short. The vast majority of them you're going to see are one page, um, which is great. Um, they take uh, many different forms. We'll look at some different templates or examples. There's lots of different ways these are graphically displayed. You can choose whatever works best for you or that you like. Um, so there are no two logic models are the same. We'll talk about the common elements that you're going to see in almost every logic model. There's lots of different templates and formats out there that you can use. And really, they should explain the goals and practices of an organization clearly and simply. Here's another really um, concise definition from the Kellogg Foundation. And the resources at the end, I'm going to give you a link to a document from Kellogg um, that, that really goes into a lot of detail about logic models. As I mentioned, they're very commonly used in the nonprofit world, particularly around um, grant funded projects. Um, and even though that document is a little dated, it is cited in almost every article or information that you read about logic models. That Kellogg document is really kind of foundational to how people approach using and developing them. So a logic model is a systematic and visual way to present and share your understanding of the relationships among the resources you have to operate your program the activities that you plan or the changes or results that you hope to achieve. So in short, logic models use words or pictures to describe the sequence of activities thought to bring about change and how these activities are linked to the results in the program, the results that your program or service is expected to achieve. 
So just to quickly recap what we have covered so far about theories of change and logic models. Theories of change focus on explaining why change will occur. Again, that concept of the missing middle. And in that sense, again, is more big picture and strategic. It can either be written out or take graphic form. And I'll show you, again, I'll show you an example of that a little later. We're looking today at logic models as really a graphic representation focused on a particular program or service helping you plan what resources you need, what activities you're going to engage in, and then what outcomes you expect um, for your patrons at the end of that. So as I mentioned, logic models take a variety of forms, and there's a huge wide swath of templates um, that are available for use if you just Google logic model template. Um, however, there are four elements of logic models that you'll see consistently across all of the examples that you'll see. And those are the four that you see on the screen here. So inputs, activities, outputs, and outcomes. So let's take a little bit of a dive into what each of those terms means in the context of your logic model. So inputs are the resources or investments that a library puts into a program or service. So that's people, staff time, your library budget, what supplies are you using, and things like that. You can think of inputs as the raw materials of your program or service. It could be technology, it could be a laptop, it could be things like that. Activities are probably the most what they sound like. These are the things that you do as a part of your service or program. So it could be events that you hold, it could be meetings that you have, it could be classes that you teach, it could be a LibGuide that you publish or a brochure that you develop, um, it could be a tutorial you develop. So it's the actual activity um, of the program or service that you're developing. Your outputs are the direct result of your program activities. They're quantifiable units of service and products generated by your program activities. So outputs are things that you can count, like the number of people that you've trained or taught as a part of your program or service, um, the number of events or classes, the number of participants that you've reached. Um, what's important to remember about outputs is that they don't measure the impact of a program, but rather they always answer the question, how many or how much? They're always countable things. So the fourth um, common element in logic model are outcomes. And this is where you're really trying to get at the change or the improvement or the enhancement that your program or service is designed to accomplish. Um, outcomes are typically separated in logic models into short, medium, and long-term outcomes. And again, they reflect the change your program is designed to affect. The question that outcomes answer, as opposed to outputs, is what difference did we make? Um, in the project outcome, um, sort of logic model theory of change approach, the question that we ask is what good did we do? So what difference did we make for our patrons? What constructive um, changes did we make in our communities, in the populations that we serve as a result of our program? So short-term outcomes typically reflect changes in learning, which can be changes in patrons' awareness, attitude, knowledge, or skills. Medium-term outcomes look to changes in actions, behavior, or decision-making. And long-term outcomes focus on changes in social, economic, civil, or environmental conditions. So let's say that I had a program that was designed to teach patrons how to use library resources to craft a small business plan. Short term, my desired outcome is going to be that they're more aware of the library databases and resources that would help them write their plan. My medium term outcome might be that they actually used those um, library resources to craft a business plan. Okay, I've made a change in the behavior or the action that they took. In a long term, um, outcome that I might be hopeful for is that they've actually started a small business as a result of the plan that they were able to create using my resources. So I might see more um, small business in my community. So I've affected this sort of long term change um, in my community or for the population um, that I serve. 
So if those are the consistent elements you'll see in almost every logic model, I did want to touch on some other features that you will often see that I have found helpful um, in creating the sort of one page graphic description of uh, my program, my goals, my activities, my outcomes. Um, so you might find these helpful. I've also put um, an example of a logic model template. So you can have, you can kind of visually look at an example with all of these elements um, put together while I talk about how these other um, elements that you see in here might help you. So you'll see on this one, for example, there's kind of this place where you can put in assumptions or a context. So here's where you can briefly describe your situation, what need you are fulfilling, if you've done some sort of needs assessment, um, the stakeholders that this program or service affects, as well as connections to your library's mission and vision. So you, if you're using this to help you accomplish a strategic plan to show how you're fulfilling your mission and vision, you can connect the activities of this particular program or service back to that. Um, your library's mission and vision. Um, evaluation, here you can outline what data you'll need to collect in order to assess this program or service. Um, I think this is a really important piece of this. What a logic model really can do is set you up for um, a successful assessment and evaluation of your program and understanding if you actually have you know, affected the outcomes that you've outlined here. I think one of the faults um, that often happens in my own library and, and by myself is that we often will start a program or service and think, oh, we should have been collecting this data all along to understand what's happening. This kind of forces you to think through that process, which is why, as we'll talk about later, it can be really good for just sort of general project management, making sure you've set yourself up to collect the data that you need to involve the people that you might need to get that data from so they're not surprised by your request and you get it in a timely ma manner and things like that. Um, you can also um, outline internal and external factors that might affect your program or your activities or outcomes. So sometimes a particular program or service you often might be heavily influenced by some external factors that may be slightly out of your control. And this is a nice place to note that that might um, be the case. Um, you can just document those here so that um, you can be clear that you're aware of, of what's happening in your larger environment that might impact what you're doing. And you'll see here, um, sometimes some templates will separate out and it's typically next to, the, it's typically with outputs or next to activities where you can um, sort of outline your participants or collaborators, like who you're expecting um, to be in attendance. If your program or service is reaching out to a particular population, a particular academic department, you can kind of document who your expected participants or collaborators are as you work through that process. So the example that you see on the screen is one of my favorites because it includes all of these elements that I've just been talking about. And it really shows you how you can get a lot of information into a single one page graphic, which brings me to a question that you might have, which is how much detail are you writing in each one of these sections if you're just describing this a lot of information on a single one page graphic. And I think the answer to that is that you're kind of focusing on bullet points with just enough information so that you're effectively communicating that item. So for example, under my inputs, I don't wanna just list staff time because that's really general and doesn't communicate a lot. But I could do something like two part-time staff, one or two full-time staff and one part-time staff member, or I could do like, 0.5 FTE or, or something like that. So I don't have to go into detail like it's Joe Smith and it's 20 hours of their week on these days. That's too much, but just staff time is just too general. So you're kind of aiming for enough information to communicate, but it can just be bullet points, phrases, doesn't have to be complete sentences there. Okay, so now that we've covered all of these kind of basic elements of a logic model, I wanted to ask you um, an additional quick poll question. So now that you've seen a logic model and heard me talk a little bit about all of the elements are there and the ways that they might be used, 
Um, what are some potential uses that you might see at this point about logic models in your library? And you can mark um, as many of the options that apply to you. Okay, great. So yeah, um, this is a little bit of a, of a leading question on my part because these are all great uses um, for these kind of logic models. Um, they're really, really great um, in terms of planning, um, grant writing. Um, in the nonprofit world, a lot of grant funders actually require logic models. Um, as a part of the grant application because they really want to you they really want to be sure that their funding programs where you have a solid plan and you have this assessment and evaluation pieces that you've thought about what your outcomes are and how you're going to determine if the program actually um, created the outcomes that you've designed because they want to be funding programs that actually are working. Um, it's also a way that you can, um, for yourself outside of a grant funded situation, understand if a program your service offering is really effective. And if it's not, maybe how you can change it. I know sometimes in my own library, we always talk about how we are always adding things to do without <laughs> stopping doing other things. And sometimes that's just a matter of kind of laying out what are your expectations for what a program should accomplish. So great, we can close that. Okay, so like I um, said, thanks for answering that question. Um, so again, what's on the slide now are some of the most common uses of logic models. They can help you plan a new program or service, making sure that you capture everything you need and will do while setting yourself up for successfully completing, evaluating, and assessing that program or service. Um, Logic models, of course, can be particularly helpful in grant writing where you need to show your impact to your funder. And generally, I can think they can be really good tools to assist with project management. They can help keep you focused and prevent kind of project drift or, you know, scope creep where what you originally set out to do kind of meanders um, and maybe you're not doing what you originally were doing. This can kind of help bring you back um, to what you originally um, intended to focus on. So I'm gonna briefly show you two examples of logic models in action. One is kind of big um, in scope um, and it kind of takes that theory of change approach from a public library. And then I'm gonna show you an academic library example, which is focused on one very specific program and kind of give you an idea of how different visually these can look um, and, and how they've been used um, by these two institutions. So I am going to launch this. Okay, can you guys, Devin, can you see the logic model? No, so if you click share screen again, and then... Um, okay, let me stop sharing and then share again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Um, so this is the public library example, and it was the Rochester Public Library, and they're using this really comprehensive logic model that aligns with their strategic plan. So again, you can see the theory of change approach in this particular um, logic model, in this particular example. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how Rochester has used this and how it has helped them be successful um, in additional projects that they've done. Um, so they report that this comprehensive logic model serves as a template for their staff 
who plan and implement activities, devise marketing strategies, determine indicators, and develop evaluation methods. By building a logic model for programs and projects that aligns with their overall logic model, they guarantee that there is a clear path to at least one of their short-term outcomes. So they've created this big comprehensive logic model that talks about here are all their activities, here are their short and long-term outcomes. They're using this to make sure that all of the programs and services that they offer align with their outcomes, align with their strategic plan. And it helps them make sure that when they're planning, they're sticking to those things that they've set out to accomplish in their strategic plan. So one example of how that they have taken this big comprehensive plan and then used it in a sort of an individual program was they created their 2017 summer reading program, which they called Summer Playlist, which was to address a particular goal in their strategic plan. So by creating a logic model for their summer reading program, they were able to um, increase the participation in that program by 52%. 96% reported a positive experience and 82% of their participants say they gained a new skill, learned a new fact, or tried something new. More importantly, the program participants spent over 120,000 hours reading or engaging in activities, and that participation time exceeded the previous year by 125%. So what they report is this logic model really helped them develop a program that was successful and that they were able to measure the success for and able to show how the outcomes they produce were related um, to their strategic outcomes. So it can make that connection between all these individual programs and services that you are offering and connect that back to your bigger strategic plan to make sure that you are accomplishing your goals. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and show you the, um, the academic library example. All right, so what you should be seeing now is the St. Louis University logic model. Um, and again, this example shows a logic model with a much, much smaller scope, right? It's focused on one outreach mobile reference service where they were taking reference service out of the library and they were going to another building on campus to help students in, in a particular program um, that was housed in that space. Um, so it shows how useful logic modeling can be for planning a new service, understanding what resources need to be marshaled, what activities are going to take place, and what evaluations do you need to ensure that you've met your planned outcomes and made an impact. So you can see here they've got all of their resources, they have their personnel, their funding, their time, what facilities they're using, what supplies they're using, that they need support from administration, all of these activities, how they're going to start their service, um, their web page, how much they're going to be there, their outputs that they're going to count, their flyers, their brochures, their signs, their web page. Again, it's those countable things that you've got, what their outcomes are going to be, what the big scale impacts of that is going to be. And then you can see they've also got an idea of their evaluation. How are they going to determine if it is worth their time to continue offering this service in a space outside of the library. So again, very, very small scale, but another simple visual one page bullet point. You can see they haven't used complete sentences, not an incredible level of detail, but enough to communicate um, what they'll be doing and what they need. Okay, go back here. All right, so now that you've um, seen a couple of examples, I wanted us to try um, to fill out a simple logic model um, as a part of this presentation. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of the scenario when we kind of work through um, what we might enter into each section. Um, so in this case, I'm going to try, my scenario is this, I'm going to try to reach out to an underserved population. Those are ESL students on my campus. 
So I want to create some kind of orientation program for them that introduces them to general library services, books they can check out, spaces they can use to study, things like that. I'm trying to increase their engagement with the library and I want to help them further their education beyond their ESL classes. So I'm trying to encourage them um, to keep taking classes after they um, complete their um, ESL classes. So I'm going to switch over here. Um, share this back again. All right, so I have um, got the simple logic model up on the screen. It's got those four most column, common elements that we've been talking about. Got my assumptions there on the left. I've got this underserved population. I have got um, potential students, potential curriculum students. I could get them enrolled in a degree program maybe after they complete um, their ESL classes. Um, I want to get some greater engagement with the library that's going to benefit the college as a whole. It's going to benefit my community um, because I'm, you know, I'm in furthering their education, hopefully, things like that. So you guys can use the chat. Um, if you have suggestions for what might go in each section. And I will type them in. So first, what might, what might, what are some of the inputs um, that we might want to have um, here? Yes, staff and teaching time. Oh, it's not going to let me type in there. There we go. So we've got F. Great. Technology. That's another good one. Um, we maybe don't need any extra funding, right? So that's not something. Um, that we need here because we're using our particular staff time. So one of the other things that we might think about, though, as an input is um, support from ESL faculty. Um, if I want to bring them, um, if I want to bring um, these students into the library, I'm going to need to talk to their faculty. Maybe I'm going to want to do it during their class time. So I need to think about um, that I'm going to need that um, support out there um, as well. Um, let's see what else you said. Ah, library staff learning key Spanish phases. That is great. So maybe one of the inputs that I need to do is some, um, some second language learning for library staff. That's a great idea. Any other resources that you can think of um, that we might want to put into a program like this? Supplies is one, right? So if we want to come out with any kind of um, flyer or handout, maybe that's bilingual that the students um, could take away um, after their orientation. So you want to think about supplies as being something that you might need as a part, ooh, giveaways, that's a good one. Right, so I might entice them to happily remember the library by offering them some sort of little giveaway um, that might have the library website on it so I can help them get back. That is a great suggestion. Okay, that's a good basic list of the things that we might need if I want to develop this orientation program. So let's move on and talk a little bit about what activities might occur as a part of this orientation program. So I'll give you a minute to think of that. And again, just pop your ideas into the chat.
Yeah, these are some good suggestions. So publications, right? Hand out some flyers that we might want to develop. Um, could put flyers in and around where I know they, um, where I know those students have those classes so they can see those flyers. Um, ooh, a virtual tour of the library. That's a great um, activity or something that I might want to do. You could also, of course, do a physical tour, bring them in and show them things. Uh, yeah, promote via social media. I'm going to need to do some marketing of this orientation program, so that's a great suggestion. Um, a way to reach out to students. We have one person who suggested food. Oh yeah, that could actually be over here um, in, in inputs, right? We might need some, um, food always helps with students, right? <laughs> yeah, partner class visits with ESL faculty, that's an excellent activity. Ooh, ESL students was right. We could recruit some ESL students with experience to help us with that. It's always great when students um, help other students. Um, they tend to take that word of mouth um, advice pretty seriously. Ooh, readers advisory for second language. Books and materials. It's a great. I'm going to squish this down so it's a little bit smaller. So I've got a little more room. Okay, couple. Okay, so we have the reader's advisory. And another section for a cultural display. That's great. We might want to create a display of those materials when we know we're having those students in so that they can see that there are English language learning materials or we might have a books that they can check out in um, the language that they speak natively. So, and we have some materials that kind of do both um, at the same time in our ESL collections. So they've got a, a for example, a Spanish portion and an English portion to help people um, easily learn to read in English. Those are great um, examples. And you can see this can be really helpful brainstorming too as you're thinking about what are the activities that I wanna do. So let's move on to outputs. Outputs are those things that I count, right? So they answer the question, how much or how many? So if we think about the activities that we have outlined here, what are some of the outputs that we're gonna to wanna to count as a result of the activities that we've engaged in. Yeah. How many, how many of our ESL students attend our tours? I, some, I'm going to put survey down in evaluation, right? Because we're going to want to, um, so now evaluation kind of moved up here. Let me see if I can squish this down. A little bit. So evaluation, let's, let's hold survey down there. Um, Yes, number of displays created. Number of virtual tours developed. Uh, number of faculty partners, that's a great one. Yeah, so, so I'm gonna say social media engagement, number of retweets, likes, et cetera on social media, I can count that. 
number of hits to libguide. That's a good one. Okay, these are great examples of what we're counting. Oh, number of freebies given out. That's a good one. How many giveaways we have given out? Yeah, number of books checked out in different languages. How much uh, increase did we see in our circulation as a result of, of this orientation program? That's definitely something that we can count. All right, that is a good list. So let's think about finally um, what sort of outcomes we might have um, as a result of these of this orientation program. So let's start with short term. Any ideas about short term outcomes that might we might want to accomplish or that we might hope to see in our ESL student population um, as a result of our activities here? Yeah, increased knowledge of library services. They know now, right, that there are materials that they can check out. They know that there are spaces that they can come study in. They, they have an, a new level of knowledge and awareness of the resources. Repeat visits, right? We want to see them um, come back a second time. Um, database usage up. These are good short term outcomes for us. Again, there are those changes in sort of knowledge, awareness, um, and project outcome. One of our um, things that we measure is confidence. They feel more confident using the library. That's a good short term outcome um, for somebody. Ah, yeah, better staff interaction. Um, they can trust that the library will help them. Um, trust. Library better. Shrink this down real quick too, so we don't run out of room. Okay, so our let's move on to our medium term. Um, these can be changes in action and behavior or decision making. Um, we might actually want to shift our repeat visits down here to medium term, right? So we want them in a sense because we want them to, um, you know, the next time they have a need, um, we want them to think, hey, um, let's type this in here. Um, they come back to us again, right? Because they thought, oh, the people at the library were nice and helpful. My decision making when I have an information need the second time is changed because I went to the library before and now I'm going to make this decision to come to the library again because I think they can probably help me with this new thing um, that I'm working on. Yeah, purchase more ESL materials because of more demand. That's a great one. It's a great one. Library staff feel more comfortable and you might even employ an ESL student as a student worker. Yeah, you've definitely changed some actions and behaviors there. Perfect. So let's think a little bit. I'm going to squish these down even more just for these purposes. So I'll start us off on the long term. So 
Um, one of the reasons, like at my institution, that we work with our ESL students um, is that we want to long term, we want to transition those students from just taking ESL classes to taking curriculum classes, right? They're this great group of potential students. For us, they come just to take, sometimes it's a free ESL class that might be their first English class that they've ever taken. Um, but if they move through that ESL program, they're great candidates for moving into a curriculum program so that they can gain a new credential, a new degree, um, they can move up um, in terms of their economic stability. So we really want to help capture these students and help them um, move into the curriculum programs. So long term, what I'm hoping for is that more ESL students enroll in the curriculum. Let me make that smaller again. In a degree program. So another long-term suggestion, suggestion shifts culture and library and campus folks to feel that students are welcome and the ASL students talk to potential college students. So that's right. So we want maybe our ESL students, um, um, they're sort of ambassadors. Um, I'm not spelling that correctly. Right, so your, your ESL students who've, who've engaged with you, who maybe have, um, you've encouraged to enroll in that curriculum or degree program, they become your ambassadors in their communities, right? And they're encouraging their friends and their neighbors and their family members to say, hey, the college is a great place. And um, they really helped me and, and um, I was able to get this degree or credential and, and now I'm making more money or I'm doing X, Y, or Z. Um, so they have a more meaningful career or whatever it is that their ultimate goal is. That's a great suggestion. Library budget increases for more. That's a good one. Right, so you've proven that you know, this program that you've created is benefiting the college, right? You're create, you're getting, you're gaining students for the college and you're helping those students stay and stay engaged. Um, that's a really good argument to say, we need more money. We could do more good <laughs> if we had more, even more resources for these students. So that's a great uh, long-term suggestion. So again, you can see that these long terms are really these sort of big community based changes in social, economic, environmental conditions or civic conditions. I'm really trying to affect a change um, in the community um, for this population of students. So I'm trying to answer that question. What difference did I make? Well, I, I helped somebody, you know, um, we have some, um, in my particular community in Charlotte, we have some economic mobility issues. Um, this is one of those ways that I can help move that needle um, with this particular program or service. So it really, it can be motivational as well to think about these or the, maybe the impacts that I can have um, with this program. So before we move on from this particular logic model, um, let, we talked a little bit, some ideas came up about how we might want to evaluate this program. So one of those was a survey, right? So we want to understand what did, our, um, what did our ESL students who came to an actual tour, took a virtual tour, had a librarian come speak with their class. Um, what, you know, what did they think about that experience? We'll need some kind of assessment tool there, you know, to understand maybe a little bit about what they learned. Um, any other um, evaluation that you might want to do um, in order to help assess whether or not we've been successful here? So establishes college reputation. I'm gonna add that one in there while you guys are thinking about evaluation.
Um, so just thinking about a couple of other things. Um, oh, what kind of evaluation do we want to do? We've got some kind of survey. What other data that we might need to collect is we're going to need to ask maybe institutional effectiveness for enrollment data about our ESL students, right? We're going to need to collect that information from them. So that's something we might want to note here um, because that involves an outside department. So we might want to tell them, hey, we're starting this program at the end. We'd like to have this data so that they've got a heads up and we, we can be sure we can get that data. Right, track data, rate academic success and retention for participating students. What can we get our hands on um, that will tell us about that? Ooh, a focus group. That's really great. And that's also, we, we did put giveaways and food under our resources, but often um, one of the things that we need when we do focus groups is some sort of incentives um, for people to come to focus groups. So that's, um, that's an important thing to think about when you're planning so that you have the funding available for that or you've got that um, in line. Impact of library visit on student assignments reported by faculty. That's a great um, evaluation piece. We want to see that they've been um, more successful in their classes. So we, beyond that, we could look at you know, GPA, retention, as was mentioned already, we can collect all of that data um, together to try to, um, again, show the impact of this program, to have hard data that we can report back to our college administration, our funders, whoever we're, we're um, reporting some of this information to, to say, here, here's this program we designed, here's the impacts that we sent out to have, and here's the data that shows that we really did have an impact um, by creating this program. All right. Well, thank you all so much for thinking about how we could do this. I am going to switch back here. Just wanna be conscious of time and leave some um, time for questions at the end if you do have any. Um, so just to recap um, everything that we've kind of talked about today, um, Logic models are one page, right? They're visual, they're graphic. Um, they show everything about um, your program and sort of the connections between them in this very simple graphic way. Um, they're really good at fostering good program planning. They force you to think through what resources do I need? If I'm gonna have that focus group at the end, I better have some incentives. If I'm gonna need to get data from my IT department or from institutional effectiveness or from some other organization, then I need to note that. I need to contact them. I need to make sure that they're aware that I'm going to be asking for this data and that it will be available to me in a timely manner. That all needs to be planned and thought out. So I think it sets you up for really good program planning so you don't miss a huge piece of what you really need. Um, they help you identify resources and partners. Again, as you're thinking through this, okay, my ESL faculty come up as a natural partner in our example. So I need to reach out and talk to them and help get them on board. Again, I'm gonna need data from different groups. And so I need to contact them and make them aware. Um, so it identifies people who can provide you resources and that you need to partner with. They assist you again with project management, keeping the scope of your project from drifting off course from not focusing on what you really um, originally were kind of setting out to accomplish. They set you up for good evaluation and assessment of your project, again, forcing you to think through, um, what am I gonna need to help show the impact of this project? And again, they can help you show funders the impact of the time and money they have invested in your library and your project, whether that's a grant funder, whether that is your, your county commissioners or whoever controls your funding for a public library or for your college administration, you're saying the library is a thoughtful planner of programs and services. We think through what resources we need, what activities we're going to engage in, what the outcomes of those are and how we can prove that we have accomplished what we've set out to. And I think that only builds your reputation as someone who is a wise steward of funds that you are given. Um, and whether again, it's a formal grant reporter, a grant funder that you have to report to, or just your general library reporting up through 
um, your administrative chain that um, you've got something where you can really show them, here's what we do. Um, and here's the good that we do um, in the end. Um, I did want to um, provide you with some resources um, that have been useful to me. So there is a website called um, the Center for Theory of Change, which explains a lot about theories of change and how they're used. Um, there's a logic model development guide. Um, that's the Kellogg Foundation resource. It's a it's a big, um, there's a lot of information there, but like I said, it is really cited over and over again. And almost everything you read about logic models kind of goes back to that Kellogg Foundation document about um, as a big funder, kind of their perspective on how you can develop a logic model. And it really goes into a lot of detail um, with every step. Um, there's some links to the uh, a University of Minnesota um, website that kind of breaks down what is a logic model, what do the terms mean, kind of walks you a little bit through the process, talks a lot about, you know, clarifying out, you know, activities versus outputs versus outcomes so that you're really clear about what is what. Um, as you're filling this out, Pell Institute site does sort of the same thing, a lot of walking you through the process of completing a logic model, um, if you'll find that helpful. And then um, another quick resource about identifying components of a logic model that will help you um, as you're filling those out. Um, so thank you. Um, it's just about three o'clock, so we've got time for questions if anyone has them. Um, if there are questions that pop up later, there's my email address again. Um, but I did want to thank you all for coming this afternoon and indulging my love <laughs> of logic models. So I'll stop talking and let you all ask any questions that you might have. Um, someone asked if I could send you the logic model. Devin, I can send everybody a copy of this PowerPoint so that they have all the links and a copy of, of the one that we completed. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I'll send that out. Um, if we don't have any follow-up questions, I guess I'll just go into housekeeping. Um, so later today when the recording is fully processed,